Hi guys, and welcome to part two of this data analysis section. And uh, in this in this little video, we're going to be having a look at charge calibration. So something that's very important in handling XPS data uh, is, is charge calibration. We're going to go through a little bit about why that is and, and how we can do to compensate for that in, in this video. So we're going to cover why we need to calibrate, how we need to calibrate, and, uh, and touch a little bit on how we choose what we calibrate to. So first things first, why do we need to calibrate our data? Uh, so this is not really an issue when you're looking at conductive samples, but a lot of time in XPS we like to look at insulators or semiconductors, and for this there's going to be some charge buildup. So as we remove electrons from the sample, we're going to be getting positive charges building up on the surface of our sample. And as a result, this means that further photoionization is going to be affected by this kind of broad positive charge buildup, um, and we're going to need some way to compensate for this. A couple of examples here of just some zirconia ZRO2 with and without a charge compensation system. Um, and you can see on the left there, we've got a bit of a broad mess with uh, not much usable information there. Whereas when we use our charge compensation system on the right, we've got our nice well-defined doublets that we would expect from bulk ZRO2. So how we achieve this typically on, a, on an instrument level is to use an electron flood gun. And, and this sort of floods electrons to the surface and neutralizes this positive charge buildup. Um, the problem that this gives us is that this does tend to shift binding energies to lower values uh, than they should be. Um, some systems get around this uh, by using a dual neutralization system where they use a combination of electrons and uh, an argon ions to uh, to bring the surface back to neutral but even still it's definitely recommended that you just have a look at the calibration and uh, and just check there's nothing nothing amiss there um, so we need some way to do that and we're going to move over to CASA now and just have a look at that Right, so I'm going to open up a couple of examples. First one, just a very simple carbon overlay. And now carbon is something that we would typically look to calibrate to. There's a lot of controversy around calibration and what's best to calibrate to, etc. And However, uh, it's still generally recommended to start off looking at carbon. Uh, and as long as you report what you calibrate to and the energies you look to calibrate to, uh, then this does go some way to kind of explain what your process is and what your data is and, and therefore can be used to uh, to compare with literature values. Um, carbon generally tends to appear on everything as an overlayer. It absorbs from the atmosphere, um, which is one of the reasons that makes it such a good reference point for insulating materials, um, but also one of the reasons that make it a little bit of a controversial pick uh, since the exact speciation of these carbons isn't perfectly known uh, and there can and has been seen to be some shifts in these carbon overlays. However, it does remain the principal choice for calibration and as such we will, we will start with this uh, at least. So up here, spectrum processing or if you press F8 uh, you can bring up the spectrum processing window and we're just going to open up this calibration tab. <clears throat> now we can scroll through our samples here and pick out um, a region of interest. And as I said, we're going to we're going to go to the carbon and start here. the The simplest thing we can do is to just click on the peak maxima. So here we've got about two hundred eighty one eV, and we're just going to shift this to two hundred eighty four point eight. Again, there are a range of values which are chosen for what to calibrate to, but generally between 284.6 and 285. Um, so when you're calibrating, if you're comparing to something from the literature, then absolutely make sure that you know what the data has been calibrated to, what your sample has been calibrated to, and then you should be able to figure out what binding energies are, are sensible. So. If we click, I'm just going to click edit mode so we can toggle the sample name. 
Um, if you click on the sample name here, you will highlight all of the VAMAS blocks associated with that sample. And then what we can do is we can just click apply to selection. And that will, you, you'll have seen the X axis there just shift. That's going to have moved everything across. We can check, uh, first of all, we can click on the peak maximum. You can see that's now about 284.8, uh, which is what we shifted it to. Uh, if we go into processing history, we can also see any kind of treatment of the data that we've done, um, such as calibrations. And we can see if we scroll through all of the blocks, they've had the same calibration done to each one. So, so that's one way that we can do it. Simply click on that and uh, and apply that to all of the uh, the blocks. I'm just going to remove this calibration. And if I right click on the spectrum, I can propagate the processing. So there's no processing been done to this now because I removed it. So I'm just going to propagate that to the other blocks. Uh, and that will just remove the calibration from from every single from every single block here. So another popular way to calibrate is if we open up the quantification. Um, we're going to go through in a bit more detail about how to do regions and components in upcoming uh, videos. So don't worry too much about following along. Uh, what I'm creating here isn't necessarily the most important thing for you to learn at the moment got a very very vague peak model in there it doesn't have to be perfect I'm just gonna call the main peak CCCH so now we we actually want to, to calibrate to a component so if you want to if you've got a broad carbon region and you want to calibrate specifically to the low binding energy carbon you can put in your peak models come to calibration and then click component here and that will fit the uh, the measured energy calibration box with the peak maxima from this component that we fit then here. So again, we're going to select all of the blocks up here by clicking on the name. This time, I'm also going to adjust regions and components. Um, so first, if I just do it without. So I'm just going to apply this to a single block now. You can see if we apply this calibration, then our, you know the peak model we've just put in is now shifted, and we're going to have to refit that. Um, whereas if we go to adjust regions and components, we can then apply that to everything and this will move our regions and any models that we've put in by the same amount as the calibration as well. So it just saves you from redoing what's already been done. So that's calibrating to a component. One other thing uh, that a lot of people do, particularly if you've got, for example, in this, we've got some palladium nanoparticles which are supported on a silica surface. Um, we're more interested in the palladium. This is just a commercial silica, which we uh, we know we can kind of um, extract the properties of that quite easily just based on the, the bulk sample. Uh, so, so one other possibility is we can look to, to calibrate to this silica as well. So if you do have a, a reference sample, um, you can rather than calibrating to the carbon, you can calibrate to the to the silicon. And there is an, an example for you to go through, <coughs> uh, which will be on the Guru page. If you're watching on uh, YouTube and you want to get some example data sets to play with, um, follow the link in the description to the Guru page, and that'll have some of these to download, and you can and you can get practicing with some of these. So here, we've just got some some sulfur supported on um, silicon. And uh, and here we can just do a quick calibration to 103, where silicon dioxide should be. Again, you can you can do this by components. You can just click on the peaks, it's whatever your preference is. But what we can see when we calibrate. Is if we overlay everything, normalize just for, we can now see that these peaks all overlay um, really nicely, and we can be con uh, confident that we've got consistent uh, energy differences between uh, or energy similarities between the four samples, which are all from the same bulk silicon. Um, you can see our carbon here. We've got some quite low 
carbons as well, which is going to make calibrating to them quite difficult. Um, and you can also see that if you were to just treat some of these as single peaks, you might not necessarily be picking out the same peak maxima. Um, whereas here and again, our oxygen's um, generally looking pretty, uh, pretty consistent there as well. And now we can be quite confident in the differences in our uh, in our silicon uh, in our sulfur regions as well. So grab some of those data sets. Do have a play. Uh, it's just the best way to uh, to learn. And uh, in summary, hopefully we've shown why charge calibration is so important and why we need to to do it to our uh, samples um, but the message to really take away is just be consistent between your samples so if you're calibrating something to carbon and comparing between samples then uh, it's, it's generally going to be recommended to calibrate everything to carbon and always report what you've calibrated to so if you're comparing between literature and your own you know exactly what's going on and, and anyone that wants to compare to your work uh, also is going to know what that was calibrated to and uh, and how they can use that information so thank you for joining us for this one um next up we're going to be going into a bit more detail about some of the things i was just doing there which is uh, setting up regions for analysis and uh, and sort of get backgrounds for our peaks so we'll see you then cheers <laughs>